Big data continues to be one of the hottest buzzwords in the industry. And one component of big data, alternative unstructured data sets, is a growing uh, focus in the industry. I'm here with Armando Gonzalez, who is CEO of Ravenpack, to talk a little bit about what people are doing with alternative data sets uh, in the financial industry. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you for inviting me. So what kind of alternative data sets are people actually looking at? I know that's been kind of a hot topic recently. What kind of data sets is Ravenpack um, gathering? And kind of what are the challenges in, in looking at those? Yeah, so we are currently focused primarily on news. Uh, news analytics is one of our key driving forces in the marketplace. Uh, at the same time, we were also looking at social media. Uh, when you think about news, we're looking at some of the more traditional providers uh, like Dow Jones, uh, Wall Street Journal, Barron's, but we also develop relationships with providers like Benzinga that do a, a fantastic job in, in surfacing information on small, mid-cap companies. And in, in aggregating all this content, you end up with a pretty large data set of, of information on public companies. So once we uh, aggregate all this information, we then apply technologies that surface interesting insights out of them. You also mentioned alternative data sets like payments and like internal data um, for various firms. Is that what are the challenges in looking at that type of data? Right. So alternative uh, data doesn't necessarily limit itself to uh, unstructured. Um, there are data sets like payments data that are a mix of structured and unstructured. Payments may include the transactions themselves. Uh, but also references to the products that uh, people buy or the businesses in which they shop. And all that information is not defined in a structured format. Mm -hmm. So natural language processing technologies are quite useful in uh, mining those data sets. And we can go into either point of sale data, we can look into uh, credit card transaction data, you can look at uh, the receipts. That are, that are being distributed by people. Um, when you apply these technologies, you end up getting a better sense of what people are buying. And now, of course, everything is anonymized, so you get more of a consumer trend or a consumer behavior element that you can then use to make predictions. For example, on the next earning cycle, you can make predictions on revenue. You can make predictions on general sector trends and whether this sector will outperform another based on how much consumption or how much business activity is, is taking place in that, in that sector. And what specifically types of internal data do you see firms looking at? One of the key areas and the types of data that uh, firms are, are actively looking at is research. Hmm. Uh, so if you think about the research reports that banks disseminate or the research reports that independent providers are producing, uh, we've amassed literally millions of these documents. And uh, specifically banks have created uh, or have large databases of these research reports. Uh, we're talking about on average 20, 30 page reports and uh, very difficult to analyze as right. a whole. Yeah. Uh, so that's real big data there. Um, mm -hmm. So when you think about analyzing those in conjunction with some of the public data, you can get some pretty interesting insights. So the use case there is, you know, an asset manager has thousands of emails from various banks, Credit Suisse, JP Morgan, all with these, you know, 20 to 30 page research reports. Yep. And he's looking for a way to kind of filter through that or kind of gain some knowledge without going through each and every page. Is that, is that correct? That's exactly right. Uh, as, as an example, one of our clients has, uh, was actually showing me uh, his inbox. Mm -hmm. And he had 15,000 unread emails. Uh, <laughs> and he explained to me how difficult it was. Um, and every one of those emails looked legit. It was a bank. It was a fund. It was a, an important research provider. But he said, look, I can't read that information. So all I do is kind of skim through the subject line and pick a few, and then from that, try to make decisions. So you can imagine the value if you can do that systematically and at least help the investment manager surface information that affects their active holdings or um, help the manager identify trends so that they can get research ideas and ultimately trade ideas from it. Now, looking at the analytics um, on this data, there's a lot of talk about sentiment. But right. to get, you know, kind of better um, use of it, you, you, you need the context around the data. How do you go about doing that? That's a good point. Um, so in, in the years uh, leading to the development of, of sentiment analytics and, and finance, roughly in the year 2006 or so, when our product came out and others, um, everybody thought about positive and negative. And perhaps that low-hanging fruit of going short, you know, negative sentiment and going long positive is long gone. 
Now you need to bring in a uh, context. And we developed a taxonomy that allows us to categorize individual documents based on the themes and the events that people are disseminating. So we can tell you whether it's bad in the context of a lawsuit, or we can tell you that it's good in the context of layoffs. That the company sees it as a restructuring uh, situation and they think that laying off people is going to be a good thing for the company and people start uh, and analyzing that information as a positive thing then one would have to interpret it as being positive for the stock although it's negative for the sales force right mm -hmm. or negative for the workforce uh, so those are the kinds of things that are important when you think about perspective making sure that you incorporate the themes and the context around it before you determine that something is positive or negative they're also using this context not just to generate alpha, but bring in a compliance perspective. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about how firms are, are using that? Yeah, so it's definitely one of the hot spaces now where um, alpha is obviously a, a place where one can pay for it because there's P&L behind it. But in trade surveillance, one of the, the biggest issues is that the number of false positives that compliance officers face is actually actively growing. And as a result, the more data and more trades and more transactions, it, it becomes quite difficult for them to determine which ones they should follow. When you bring in news and when you bring in public information to the mix, you can now determine whether some of these trades are, are in fact, as a result of um, information that was made public to the market. And that helps them reduce the number of false positives. More importantly, they can also relate some of the news pieces to other companies and determine whether the trades were smart trades and that people were trading, you know, pairs trading or trading off of the supplier's information or trading off of a competitor's information. So making connections that between companies and the news about those companies helps them reduce the, the workflow and ultimately be more targeted and more concentrated on the things that really matter. That's how you pick up you know, real illegal activity. Well, I'm sure compliance will continue to be a hot topic. I want to thank you uh, for joining me today to talk a little bit about these alternative data sets that Tab 4 members keep hearing about. Um, thank you so much for watching. <laughs>